Well, like if I say something absolutely buck wild and bonkers, like I say, the master comes back as a dolphin. <laughs> I know based off of your like face and your <laughs> laugh that that is not the do- the the master does not come back as a dolphin. <laughs> a dolphin with a little laser screwdriver. A dolphin would really like that. And you know that they <laughs> fuck for fun. <laughs> And welcome back to a very special episode of Who is My Doctor? Who is my doctor? Who is indeed? I am your host, Zach, and I know a lot about Doctor Who. And I'm also your host, Cassie, and I don't know a lot about Doctor Who. And it's our 50th episode, Cassie. Woo! Woo! We've been doing this way too fucking long. Woo! I said way too long. We're not... We're not even, we're only two doctors deep. We got three more to go right now, baby. Not long enough. Actually, four more to go. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the end of David Tennant's run here. Uh, I didn't deliberately time it out for this to be our 50th episode when we set out, uh, but it, by, uh, by episode 35 or so, I realized that it would be, and I was like, well, no changes can be made to the schedule now. I know. <laughs> Uh, yes, this is the end of time. The, Uh-oh. the Christmas special. Where does it go? <laughs> it ends. It's done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked this time. Well, we, we'll go get some more at the supermarket. <gasps> With some sage and some rosemary. <gasps> <laughs> Parsley. Time. <laughs> yes, this is uh, the Christmas special for 2009, and the second part is the New Year's special of 2010. Interesting. Yeah, they were they were released why, a week why apart. Why is it still labeled? Oh, I guess if it's yeah, it's part one and two. They're just it's just called the Christmas special. 2009. Well, no, but it specifically is uh, 2009. Yeah, uh, you taking pain. Yeah, just because it's the second part. Yes, this is the end of time. This is also the end of David Tennant's run. This is also the end of Russell T Davies' run as <laughs> showrunner. <laughs> Um, what sort of things are you expecting from the end of David Tennant's run from this, uh, from this last special, this home run that they're, they're, they're uh, about to make? The return of, ca- of a character we've seen before. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. I, I know. I, th- this is one of the things that did, that did get slightly spoiled for me. I know the master returns. Yes. Uh, well. The show also alluded to it when they said he will knock four times. Yeah, well, because I'm also dumb, so I I literally had to have you yeah uh, <laughs> point it out to me and explain that. <laughs> yeah, it's I felt a little bad spoiling it for you, but it was also I wanted to get your reaction in the moment, uh, and also I knew I knew we were going to get there soon enough. But yes, this is the return of the master, specifically John Sim playing the master once again. Remind me. How we left the master before. Oh, no, he killed himself, kind of. His wife shot him. Uh, and, and he chose not to he regenerate. He chose not to regenerate, yeah. In and then, David Tennant's arms. Yeah, and then David Tennant burned his body on a pyre. Uh, and the only thing that remained of him that fell off was a, a, a ring that fell onto the ground that was then picked up by uh, a hand with mysterious red, long manicured red fingernails. Ah, the doctor is a woman now, <laughs> which uh, I guess I was going to let you go on for a little. I was going to pr- pick your brain a little bit more, but this leads into my profacy pretty nicely here. How do you think the master comes back? Um. Well, how my- does the master get his groove back <laughs> and also his body? Well, because that's the thing is my original thought, because I remember the ring falling and them lingering on that image mm-hmm. for just a second longer than is necessary for like, you know, if we fade to black sort yeah. of. Yeah, someone it, someone reaches in and picks it up. It's yeah, not just- it, it was very uh, <laughs> it was like that meme. That's going around right now. That's like when the character at the end of the movie isn't dead, but it's just like an animal's paw twitching <laughs> and then roll credits. Michael Bay. You see, I yeah, know I sent them. A, I've, I've sent a what couple. Of I've done. Yeah. 
So my immediate response or my my original thought was that the ring is like like how how time lords have watches mm -hmm. that have like their memories and their time lordness mm -hmm. stashed away. My first thought would be or was that the ring has the master's like time lordness stashed away and that he would come back then as a different body in a different body okay but since you've already told me now that it's still john sim that it's still john sim i don't know because <laughs> i i don't know if it's something that we've been able to see yet on if if a time lord goes back in time if other time lords are still like in the vicinity, in the area. Because I don't think we've seen any of that in any classic Who's, or at least none of the episodes that you've shown me showcase that. And I'm not entirely sure what the Master would have been doing. Like, So you're thinking that this took place before before he died? My, my thought... Well, I'm trying to make it make sense here. Well, let me ask you the second part of the prophecy here and see if this feeds any thoughts to the first one. When the master comes back, he comes back kind of wrong. Y yes. Nazi. <laughs> he comes back as a Nazi. Yeah, that's wrong. Indeed. <laughs> he comes back. I'm just very curious. tan and with a tuft of blonde hair. <gasps> ah! <laughs> uh, so if any thoughts as to how the master could come back and also how he could come back wrong. Well, because then we go into like he is reformed, but he's reformed like partially as himself, but partially in a different body. Like I I'm imagining like, follow me on this journey. I'm imagining like a Franz Kafka, like giant cockroach person, but with the <laughs> face of John Sims. <laughs> okay. I mean, we could take that answer. That's what you want to go with. But we've also never seen anything like that happen in Doctor Who before. So without spoiling much for you, I will say this special is fucking buck wild. <laughs> I don't know what substances Rusty Davies was taking when he came up with this, but it it's going to feel real different from the rest of the show in a way that I'm not sure you're prepared for. So that literally leaves everything out on the table. Yeah. I am looking at an I spy book of possibilities. So I'm I'm like you can really just throw spaghetti at the wall and feel and feel out what you would do in this scenario. Uh because it it's 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 a little it's a little wild what actually happens. Can I do I get points then if the answer is just a little bit vague yeah, but I'm, it's I'm still okay in the ballpark? Yeah. Okay. Because if there are lim unlimited possibilities like I, will, I will take i will even give you a point if you're close enough like there's a there's a few because it's it's a little wacky wild what well, we're getting like here. the other option that i had was if he's still being performed by the same actor then it's not unlikely that he could be like in the body of a robot something like that but that makes a little bit of sense <laughs> So just to give you a little bit of hell, I will also say that for how the master comes back wrong, there's a few different ways he comes back wrong. So there's a few different things you could say, and I would take all of them. Or I would take any of them. Might be the better way to so, phrase that. I don't think he is in his like regular body. I definitely think he is in the body of something else. OK. And how do you think he gets put in that body? Then? I don't know. Zach, I'm throwing spaghetti at the wall right now. <laughs> Magic. Yeah, fuck it. That's where I'm at. You're literally giving me nothing to work from. This was, I I've don't have any other context. <laughs> We've only seen like four seasons of this show and never once has a character come back except for Daleks who are cockroaches, I guess. <laughs> and just he comes back as a Dalek. A they just keep appearing. I don't understand how Daleks keep coming back, nor would I understand how the master keeps coming back. <laughs> I will also say that in previous seasons, the master has come back with no explanation. He has died before 
and he comes back anyway. <laughs> and they and they usually don't even bother explaining it. Them doing it this time is kind of a novel approach. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know. I'll just say this then. Just say whatever you feel, and then whatever, if, we're, if you're close enough to it, we'll give you the point at the end of dolphin. it. Dolphin. It comes back as a dolphin. Sure, okay. why not? <laughs> you seem to laugh at that response. So okay. we'll say he comes back as an animal. Okay. His voice is silly. Okay. He Picasso's himself. His <laughs> eyes are in the wrong spot. His ear, he's a potato head. He's a potato he's head. He's got his angry eyes, just in case. Uh, what else is a possibility in this fucked up time world? <laughs> He's a ball of energy just flit floating around. He's only voiced by John Sims. You don't actually see his face. Tell you what, just keep say, saying whatever feels good to you. And if you and if any of what you say is right, you'll get a point. I'm going to <laughs> eat, eat. That's dolphin before he comes back as a dolphin. Uh, robot. I, I don't know if I said I said a different body. He comes back in a different body. Yeah, we'll just I'll just kick the robot I'll, Dalek. Uh, 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 he's a Furby this time. <laughs> uh, did I say, oh, I said ball of energy. He's an amorphous ball of gas. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> the time lordishness leapt from his body when he was burned in the pile. <laughs> it went into the ring. It turns out he does come back. He is just the he he is now taken over the body of of his previous wife because she was kind of a pushover doormat wife is now the master are any of these making sense <laughs> you've certainly thrown a lot of options at the wall he's a cat now he's a cat now all right and so do you have any theories as to how he might come back i already said <laughs> no, not not like in what form. What was the process that brought him back? So I said his time lordishness leapt out of his body and <laughs> leaked into something else. <laughs> I think I said it just like that. <laughs> All right. So uh, he was hooked up to a potato clock and transferred his everything into that. Uh, <laughs> like GLaDOS from the portal too. <laughs> Just strapped into a potato. I don't know that reference. <laughs> That's amazing that you just picked that. So, that you like nailed that one on the head, though. I'm so into potato clocks, Zach. You don't even know <laughs> how are potatoes conductive of energy. You tell me. Uh, the starch in them, I believe, is carries an electric charge. That means anything can be a. Yeah, a lot of things can be a battery. Potatoes just have a lot of it, so they can last long enough to be like marble. There's a at. lot of water too. Yeah. So like a watermelon could be a yeah a battery. He comes back as a battery. He comes back as a watermelon. He's a watermelon guy. <laughs> He's a thumb thumb. He's one of Floop's Fooglies. <laughs> oh. He's doing the voiceover for Beyonce in a in a Austin Powers movie. He's Nathan Lane this time. <laughs> You've seen gold member, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just like hearing. I'm just really like letting you run loose in this playpen to see what you what you oh dig out of the sand. Oh my god, he's a puppet. <laughs> Jeez, I don't think we will ever just get a Mupp just a Muppet master. Yeah, he's Walter from the Muppets, but he's the master. <laughs> oh my god, he's claymation. He's like that one episode of Community. <laughs> Everything is claymation to him, but he's just normal. <laughs> he's Abed. He comes. He comes back autistic. Hey, okay. all time lords are. I've got a little bit of the tism. He grows out of the out of the ground. <laughs> His soul enters the soil, and from above, he becomes a pumpkin. <laughs> like he's either shot into a body or grown into a body. Master o Lantern. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I got nothing else for you. I'm All right, fried. Well. Like a <laughs> I'm fried. Like pickles. He's pickle master. <laughs> well, we'll find out if any of that was true as we watch the end of time part one. Oh my god. Usually this is the part of the show where Cassie or I do a silly little ad for something we've made up. But seeing as this is our 50th episode, I just want to take a moment to thank you 
for listening and enjoying this podcast and just being really nice about everything. Uh, everything we're hearing on social media has been really nice, which is a very strange sentence to say. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of podcasts out there with plenty with professional setups and experienced vocalists, while Cassie and I are just two chuckle fucks on our couch. So it means a lot to me that you guys choose to listen to us. So happy 50th episode, everybody. Here's to 50 more. And we are back from the end of time, part one. Okay. <laughs> this, uh. Okay. This, uh, no, I'm fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm really okay. I told you it's, it, this one feels real weird. Like he had a long time to repair this one, but it really feels like he made this over like a weekend. Like I, I don't hate the. I don't hate the fact that we missed out on several uh, Dr. Beach episodes. <laughs> I don't know if you caught one of my favorites in there, but he said that he got married. Yeah. Uh, did you hear? He, did you catch who he said he got married to? Queen Bess. Which is uh, Queen Elizabeth's the first name. Because uh, he comments that they call her the Virgin Queen. Well, implying he fucked Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> I thought they hated each other. I mean, maybe that's why. Maybe he isn't. Maybe he isn't very good at it. Elizabeth the first doctor. What? My sworn enemy. What? So we'll go. We'll do the professy real quick here because I don't want to. I don't want to. I got two points. I'm gonna say I got two points because <laughs> uh, he did get his body shot into another body. You know, you're not wrong. I, I was very incorrect with dolphin. <laughs> Yeah, it was every human. I will confess, I was incorrect with Dolphin. And However. That, and that he also, he, when magic is for some reason now a real thing, uh, they... Magic is science and science is magic, Zach. <laughs> I, right, but they, they call it a potion of life. <laughs> they uh, He casts the potion of life and he comes out of a, uh, out of a little bottle. You mean out of the coven of blondes? Yeah. <laughs> And he comes out, he comes out of a little bottle, like a little genie, uh, fluctuates in and out of existence until his wife is like, hey, I had rich people pay to make the opposite of your formula. Uh. And now he is his body is half skeleton, which I guess it already was, but now you can it's, see it. Yeah. And he it's is like half uh, half corporeal, half electric skeleton. Yeah. He has electricity powers. He can fly. Yup, And he only wear a hoodie. <laughs> and he's really hungry all the time. And he eats like a Smeagol. I will say Which I do. To say hunched over and grabbing all the food at once. <laughs> I did like the I forget what the line is exactly, but it is Timothy Dalton doing the narration saying that like all the pawns are in their place the master and then it cuts to a shot of him just going <laughs> like had eating. no idea of the of the achievements he would do or something like that <laughs> he's just in a tube with a bone yeah it's like that's so fucking fun make this man more feral <laughs> I think you had I, I had asked you uh, while we were recording to uh, as as you see him acting this way remember Roger Delgado and you had you had made a pretty apt metaphor. Yeah, uh, that he is a possum. <laughs> Delgado is a fox. In more and, ways than and I he, one. And he really is kind of a possum with the way he keeps like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> you give him a whole, a whole, like, turkey. A whole Costco chicken. Yeah, it's a bigger bird, but I made the comparison that that's me with Costco chicken. <laughs> 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 I think he ate the wishbone. He the last scene is a is of him just like eating the little bits off of a bone. <laughs> I will say, yes, I'll give you I'll give you two points. You were close enough with when you when you called him a ball of energy, because I would count that as him having the having his electric powers. Yes, I I would argue for that as well. And then when you said that he gets shunted into, into another body, you are technically correct. He got shunted into everybody. Yep. Breaking news. I'm everyone. And everyone in the world is me. I'm president. 
President of the United States. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the only ones, the only ones. They're now the, the, it's no longer the human race. It is the master race. Which, you know, that was, that was where the idea for the episode came up. That, yep. that, the idea was a pun based on master race and they worked backwards from there. Yep. <laughs> they went, who would know about this? <gasps> the Ood. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, let's bring that. Let's bring them back. <laughs> it's it's a very like. There's so much happening. Well, because halfway through the episode, I went, okay, cool. We must be at the halfway point, but it was only half halfway because there was like, it was another moment that the narrator had come in and wait, wait, was yeah, like, when you speaking. say we must be at the halfway point, you mean we must be at the end of this part of part one? Yes. Okay. Like, okay, cool. We must be reaching the end of this part. Nope, we were only halfway. Yeah. It's like, this is giving finale is coming up, but turns out I was wrong. Yeah, they, just, they, they had so many places for Timothy Dalton to start giving narration. And I guess just to remind you that he was at the beginning, because at the beginning, you don't see a face. You just hear his voice in the middle. Then in the middle part, you see his voice. You see his face and you hear see his, voice. his voice. Yeah, you see his face and hear his voice. And at the end, they reveal who he's been the whole time. He's a Time Lord. And the Time Lords are returning. And he does one big actor spit. <laughs> he really does. It's very, uh, some, some visible expectorant in that one. But the Time Lords will return. <laughs> right after we just right. saw the doctor freak out that he's the last one. Yeah. Yeah, he was worried he's the last one. Well, now there's a whole planet full of them. Yeah, it turns out uh, we're doing this for Gallifrey. <laughs> I do. Uh, it, it is kind of funny that the way that they change into the master, though, is just by shaking their heads real fast. Yeah. Everybody except Wilf, because he's in a protective bubble. Good. He's, a, he's in a glass case of protection. He's in a glass box. To uh, to preserve his collector's value. Yeah. <laughs> the doctor and Donna. Donna was okay. Yeah, because too. Donna is half Time Lord. Is now. Dr. Donna. Yeah. She's fit. Her, mentally, she doesn't remember that, but physically, she's still Dr. Donna. So let's actually, that's but a good. How fucking scary, though. To watch your mother and fiance turn into the same strange man that you kind of sort of recognize, or at least kind of sort of recognize that this man is bad news. Yeah. I mean, granted, I think the reason you could tell it's bad news is because when they change back, they immediately start doing a maniacal laugh. <laughs> 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 like, and they're doing a worldwide evil laugh. Here, just laugh. loop it. You, you do it. I'll do it. And then you can just loop it in post. Ready? <laughs> Wait, hold on. I have a scratch. I have an itch. OK, one, two. <laughs> 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 uh, there's something good there. Yeah, it's. It's very much like because you would see them like run out of the house and like look at another one like, hey, you, you're me, too. You're me, too. And oh, then someone else. the same. <laughs> you got it's uh, one of the one of the reporters in the like White House press conference room was like a bigger dude. So when he turns into the master, he just has like big old blazer flippers. <laughs> yes. it's some people's around. suits are too big. Some people's clothes are too small. One thing that's kind of funny uh, they definitely made an error with it in post, but I don't I don't know if you caught it. I only catch it because I'm an effects guy. They were they replaced that guy's daughter uh, with the master mm -hmm. and she was wearing heels. But for some reason, she is the same height as John as the when he be, when she becomes the master. She's still the same height as all the other masters, despite wearing what is clearly like three or four inch heels. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, I didn't clog that. Because they had put his head there and didn't put together the, oh, he should be like four inches taller. <laughs> Do you know, just for my own curiosity, if they had him wearing everybody's different clothes, just standing in different spots like uh, I would assume like it's Deep a Roy? I would assume it's a mix. Like they they probably they there's very clearly some shots where they did have him doing different like different clothing. There are other shots where I think they just photoshopped his head onto onto the look. OK, um, I think I think it depends on what the shot was. I okay. think that's why he was. Uh, I think that's why he looked sh as short as he did in those heels, because I think they just kept her body, then did a head replacement and then changed her skin tone to be his. 
Yeah, I don't know for sure, but I assume that's why either that or they could have like had her standing there. Well, just because it was a close enough shot that I would think that for that and it's it's, you know. Oh, no, I mean, there's a wide shot. That's where you can see it, where you can see your feet. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know. I would say I don't know the the fine, the finer details. Oh, of it, no, but it's I would just any it's of the room. wider shots, I would assume that it would be a head replacement. But any of the close up ones, I, I would hope that they would have done a deep Roy and just replaced him. Yeah, there's definitely somewhere they did a deep Roy. Let's get into the Profassi a little bit here. You mentioned uh, Donna, Donna Donna already, and she's the first question on my Profassi, is that at the end, when we last saw her, she started remembering things, she's getting glimpses of her life with the doctor. Uh, what do you think? I, I specifically, uh, I did specifically catch a shot of the adipose, and that alone would make my brain explode. <laughs> Or the giant spider woman. I can forgive her. It's the adipose that I mm-hmm. would not uh, have been okay with. So the first question for your Profassi of episode two is uh, what happens to Donna as she starts to remember things? Head explode. Head explode? No. Her mind gets blown. Oh my God. Her mind definitely is getting freaked. <laughs> Chris Angel shows up. As the master though. <laughs> But he's still somehow his hair is black and also very long. <laughs> still wearing eyeliner. Yeah, he's floating. <laughs> Walks up a ladder horizontally. That's such a cool trick. <laughs> still don't know how it's done. It's probably wires, but let me believe in magic. <laughs> let your mind be freaked. I love my mind. But how is her mind freaked? What happens uh, when she remembers stuff? I don't know. Because in my head, I'm like, ooh, yeah, this is like. Unknown territory for the doctor, which is why he's as cautious as he is with Donna's state. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say that because Donna had always been exceptional around the doctor. Mm -hmm. That for whatever reason, she will probably be okay. Like, I, I, I think that. The okay. Time Lord DNA that was like infused into her is enough to protect her. So I don't think she'll snap right back into like her old self, but I also don't think she's at risk for having her head explode. OK, so you think there's something in between. OK, I'll take that as an answer. That's fine. yeah. And then the uh, the second part of the profession is a little bit uh, more intense, I suppose, of a question. Uh, as you know, at the end of this story. Uh, David Tennant regenerates. Spoilies. Uh, I mean, it's a spoiler, but they've also been setting it up the whole uh, for a few episodes now. And, you know, that's the end of the season. Uh, Spoilies. Uh, which character causes him to regenerate? Oh, no. Wilf. You think it's Wilf? <sighs> or Donna. <laughs> Wilf or Donna? Yeah. Now pick one. I know. I would feel bad if it was Wilf. <laughs> So I'm going to say Donna. <laughs> you would feel bad if it was Wilf, so you're going to say Donna? Yeah, I feel less bad if it's Donna. <laughs> All right. So, well, Wilf is a, is a British national treasure. <laughs> needs to be protected at all costs. All right. Well, in that case, the prophecy for part two is that as Donna remembers things, she won't die, but she also won't become the Dr. Donna again. And then at the end of this story, Donna causes the doctor to regenerate. We will find out together as we finish The End of Time. The End of Time! And we are back from The End of Time and the end of David Tennant's run as the Doctor and the end of (sighs) Russell T. Davies' run as showrunner. (sighs) What's, uh, What's the feelings you got right now, Cassie? kind of mixed really yeah why is that yeah i don't know it's just it did feel a little odd that the back third of that episode was just doctor and friends reunion tour yeah it was their reenactment of the return of the king (laughs) like where we've been doing this for so many years time to show you every character we've ever written mm -hmm, basically (laughs) like even down to the uh alien races yeah like the slovene yeah 
Yeah, like the Slitheen, you know, those baby face motherfuckers I thought I never had to see again. So delighted that they were in my my reunion well, tour episode. Had, well, there had to be part of the victory lap. It would be. Well, they simply had to, didn't they? <laughs> They were so likable and memorable. It is funny that the only character, the only like recurring characters that I don't think showed up in the intro in the ending were Daleks and Cybermen. Well, why would they be hanging out at like the. Yeah, I know. You know, what's the God damn it. I can't remember the name of the planet. Star Wars, the cantina. Oh, uh, Tatooine. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Mos Eisley cantina. Mos Eisley. Thank you. Yeah. Why else would they wouldn't hang out at the Mos Eisley cantina? <laughs> that would be they don't socialize. They're at home writing in their diaries. Yeah, they're too busy being catty with one another. Yeah, they're at home working on their own like evil magpie journals. <laughs> Yes, uh, that was so that was the end of time. And I, I do agree that it does feel a little excessive. Well, particularly since the jumping to the end of the episode, you do see or Dave Tennis has this wonderful moment with with Wilf where, you know, the prophecy says that he will knock four times and the entire time. You're like, surely it'll be the master. The master is is who causes the doctor's regeneration. Yeah, the knocks are in his head. It's like that's this whole thing. It's upsetting to me the fact that that happens and the doctor has this long, dramatic monologue and Wilfred has this beautiful little monologue as well. And then nothing happens for like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, he tra- he gets to travel across time a few times, say bye to all his friends. Yeah, there is a part of it where it feels a little like, um, aren't you supposed to die sometime soon? It, doctor? it feels like it has the same energy as somebody who announces that. You know, their their last day is coming up. Mm-hmm. My last day of work is Friday, but then the boss calls them in to work Saturday and Sunday as well. <laughs> I was like, man, I thought your last day was We had Friday. a party on Friday. You said Friday was your last day. What do you mean you're still here? I've already <laughs> started my morning process. Get the fuck out. And that's how I felt. <laughs> Or I was like, oh, man, he's curled up in a little he's curled up in the fetal position. This his small, teeny, tiny man. But then when he looked back up, I went, that's the same hair. Those are the same hands. I've gotten very used to seeing David Tennant's hands, <laughs> which is a weird thing. I to, feel like to be able to clock. And I feel like they were sort of doing a bait and switch there with him, like hunched over fully, like on the floor. Well, yeah, then don't have such a long, awesome monologue beforehand. It felt odd. Well, what I mean by that is. So the doctor generally doesn't regenerate the same way twice, or at least hasn't up until now. Uh, The first time he literally just faded from the first doctor to the second doctor. We never actually saw the second doctor return into the third. The second gets tortured by Time Lords. And the next thing we see is the third doctor just falling face first out of the TARDIS. And And some of it bothers me, too, when you think about past regenerations, like when the fourth doctor regenerated into the fifth part of his death was falling from a big height. And you know what he fucking did in this episode? He, f- he falled from a very big height. <laughs> he fell from a very like it was he he sugar glided th- off of a spaceship through a window and then landed tummy down on the floor. Yeah, belly flopped on this nice linoleum floor. Oh, uh, that shit was a marble. <laughs> you yeah. ever fallen? You not face first. You could have fallen ass backwards on a marble floor. Have you ever fallen? On a marble floor. On your tummy. No, just in any in any regard. Have you personally? No, I'm not. Because that shit hurts. <laughs> marble get extra hard when you fall on it. Yeah, it uh, it's one of those where that's the last third of the episode. You kind of just have to be like, okay, we're doing a thing here. We're saying goodbye to everyone because this sh- this this part of the show is over. Like there is there is a very real like, part it felt of it where very what's the like epilogue? Yeah. Which, in a sense, it is kind of the it's the end of so many things. It's not just the end of Tenants Run. It's the end of the showrunner. Uh, a lot of these characters don't come back, which is understandable. But also, do you know how cool and interesting that would have that would have been? It would have been a less like cinematic 
entry for for Matt Smith. But if he had popped up after being exposed to so much radiation as Matt Smith or as the epi- as the epilogue is going on, you notice subtle changes. He's wearing gloves because his hands are different. Yeah. Just I don't I don't know how else they could have gone about it, but it just would have been interesting to see like, oh, here changes are happening slowly but surely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it, it does feel a little excessive and there's parts of it where it feels almost like they had to come up with something just to even trim it down, like suddenly Martha and Mickey are married. Despite having really only met at the end of stole at the end of the stolen earth two parter. Well, yeah, but they're both black, so they belong together. Right. That, right. And that's another thing where it's also like, wasn't she already engaged to Lucifer? They made Tom, a whole, Tom Ellis. Yeah. Tom, Tom, Ellis. Tom Ellis's character. They had made a, they had made a point at, in the middle of season four that she was engaged to, but to Tom she Ellis. left, she left uh, with Mickey. Yeah. Which is how, you know, that that's how they're in love now. They were walking away together with Mm -hmm. Captain Jack. Oh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) I'm sure he has something to do with (laughs) it. You're like, now that that I remind you that, you're like, oh, say less. I get it now. Such a handsome man. Such a classically (laughs) handsome man. The face of... The face that launched a thousand spaceships. Yep. <laughs> the face of Boson, Illinois. <laughs> Still angry. I'll die angry about that. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit more about the story itself across both episodes. <laughs> My first note was literally just Gallifrey. Gallifrey. Time Lord lore. Whoa. <laughs> Yes, uh, the first, uh, at least for the first chunk of part two, you're, you get your first real looks at Gallifrey. Looks like it sucks. Well, it's described in much the same way. Well, one, it's it, in the middle of war because what we're seeing is, it, is it at the end of the time war? And basically, this is their last gambit to get out of the time war. The last gambit. What but, does that sound like? <laughs> Who I'm about to make a name for myself here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he. Uh, this this technically speaking takes place before the doctor kills all the time lords. This is the the, the time lords basically trying to escape that moment. Uh, well, it my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong is that this was the time lords' last ditch effort to offset their problems onto a different planet. Sort of. Um, it was more that they were they they just needed a way to get back into the universe out of the little pocket dimension the time war had cordoned itself off into. Oh, oh, I understand now why it was a bubble. Imagine a bubble, but don't. It's yeah. not a bubble. Yeah, it's but a imagine po- a bubble. It's a pocket dimension. Uh, gotcha. And so the way that they so what the time lords plan was is that they realized that they can't win the time war, so instead. They're just going to end time itself. Basically, they're, they're going to take their ball and go home. But their ball is the concept of time, which then destroys everything except for the Time Lords who ascend to be higher beings free of cause and effect. And corporeal forms. And the doctor went, excuse me, I happen to like the universe. <laughs> I would like for it to stay. So I guess I have to kill all of you instead. Well, because that he's he's making an argument to the master where he's specifically saying, like, I can fix you. I can help you. Like, you can travel with me. And the master says something along the lines of like, ah, yes, like rule the galaxy. And then the doctor just goes, no, it's just nice to look (laughs) just to participate. Like that's that's payment enough. Mm-hmm. Just being part of the galaxy and you get you do see this like almost very human side of the doctor just through that through that statement alone, because he's also really trying to reach out to the master. Yeah, he's specifically the line of you could be so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, in the first episode, especially when he's like, well, not the first episode, the beginning. Sorry. Early in this episode, the do- the master has the doctor strapped down to a gurney. Uh, <laughs> mm. and the the, the I mean the, oh no 
It's bad. A doctor stop. And so the doctor keeps trying to basically get the keeps trying to flatter the master into getting him to release him. So they can like just get him away, just get him off of Earth and do something else. And so it's a lot of like, um, like I would it would be such an honor to be by such a large brain as yours until finally the doctor sees it out and goes like, oh, by the way, you're an idiot. That guard's too tall. <laughs> Six billion eyes and not one notice that this guard next to you is an inch taller than the rest. <laughs> I was really hoping it was going to be Donna. I knew it wasn't, but I was I, a girl. Yeah, dream. no, Donna slept. Donna, Donna, was ta- Donna was taking a well, big old like, snooze. I don't think I was entirely wrong because she didn't die. No, no, you, you absolutely get the point. Something in the middle between her, nothing happening and her dying did happen. It was that her, her brain let out uh, a wave of energy that knocked out everything, including herself. <laughs> Uh, Did I miss something again? <laughs> Aw, Donna, I'm so sorry. Let's, I'm, I'm going to do this. Let's just start at the very beginning, uh, because there was a moment that I really enjoyed where you yeah, saw. We're, we're kind of going all over the place right now. Yeah, so. so let's go back to the very beginning of the first episode where. Uh, <laughs> Each episode. Legend of the Blue Box. Yeah, where you saw a piece, uh, a TARDIS in the stained glass window of a church. <laughs> Yes, I, and? I had wondered how that would feel to you as someone who grew up Catholic <laughs> to see this decorated I mean, I church. I have always, always loved stained glass windows and just the history of stained glass windows is. I will elect to uh, shut this part of the autism down for right now. <laughs> we simply do not have the time, but that is one of my favorite things about extremely old, specifically Catholic buildings Mm -hmm. is the use of stained glass because it feels very lavish and especially in cathedrals and you know a lot of places like that like yes you do want something that's very lavish this is a house of God literally Mm -hmm. God resides in those spaces so you know of course you would make these gorgeous windows that in order to make the color stand out uh Technicians would pee on the glass. So most of the stained glass is piss glass. <laughs> which I love so much. And, you know, it's depictions of of the Bible and, mm-hmm. you know, later on or like then when they're in castles, it's depictions of the royal court or, you know, still biblical figures. It's angels and doves. And, you know, now it's just kind of shapes <laughs> if you see stained glass especially if it's modern it is what it is whatever the it's, artist wanted it's to make Tardises. and yes yeah, so there is a part of me that's like i would absolutely flip my lid if i went to church again <laughs> there was just a tardis like just just not not front and center but just like off to the side just like over the over your uh over the bishop's shoulder like no one else is noticing it, but for some reason you are. I, I would absolutely lose my mind. That would cause me to go to church again. <laughs> Ironically enough. Just I, so I do I could, believe in David Tennant. Oh, our Lord and Savior, which is ironic. <laughs> I do believe in doctors. I do. I do. Which is really ironic considering that he's literally a fallen angel in good <laughs> omens. <laughs> you also seem to be really happy that this story featured, uh, the doctor's companion being Wilf, Wilford Mott. I do. It's about time Wilf, Wilf got a treat. <laughs> Wilf got to shine. Yeah. As soon yeah. as he, as soon as he like, like walked his way onto set with his little beanie, and you were just like, "Yay!" Well, because I knew that we weren't going to have the the Donna. We weren't going to have Donna resuming her role as the companion mm-hmm. for this. I, I knew that we weren't going to get that because that wouldn't have made half a lick of sense in the context of what has already happened to her. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert. I know that those two fuckers come back for the specials. <laughs> and I'm so bothered that I won't know why until much later. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to do it, do it right. Anyways. Mwah. It's not mwahaha. Have you ever started a laugh by going mwahaha? No. When I'm feeling evil, I do. 
I just feel like feel eviler. I just feel like a little evil guy, and sometimes I just feel eviler. That's Zach. What you got when you got the mwaha in your ha ha, and you gotta go mwaha. Ew, uh, the mwaha in your ha ha. <laughs> I don't want the mwaha anywhere near my ha ha. Thanks. <laughs> uh, but yes, Wilf, uh, Wilf, and the entire world are apparently having bad dreams about the master. But but everybody else seems to forget. Yeah, most people except seem except for Will. Like they know they know they had a bad dream, but they can't retain what the bad dream was. Well, yeah, because half of the bad dream is literally just. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a close up on John Sim laughing really hard is throwing his head back and then a close up of his eye real close to the camera. <laughs> and so Wilf has assembled a team of old folks called the Silver Cloak. They start searching all around town for the doctor. Meanwhile, the doctor is hanging out with the in a in a in a what is it a, a prayer circle with the ood. My favorite thing about about Wolf's little club is that he's literally just gathered a bunch of retirees with nothing else to do on a bus. On a bus, and the way that they find him is because one of the ladies calls her sister, who lives across town, <laughs> who asked her neighbor, who saw the doctor, or who saw the police box, and then saw the doctor getting out of it and running east. Like, oh, good job, Yentas. <laughs> good job. <laughs> that's that's some, that's community right there, this buddy. Is, that's why they're the greatest generation. Yeah. <laughs> Problem solvers, not like us <laughs> or their or their problem makers or their awful boomer kids. Those are all different. But the greatest generation, they're the greatest generation. I really did like the design for the elder Ood. Oh, yeah. Or he's got his brain just like showing. Yeah, not showing it. it his brain is just so big. <laughs> he's got so many thoughts and secrets and so in there. detailed <laughs> and it's busting through his skull and skin. <laughs> I feel like in in any real context that would be alarming to see someone's brain having grown no, 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 so much. No 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 no. He's one hundred years old, and the elder, he's fine. <laughs> he's the elder. He knows what's going on. And so uh, the the elder shows the doctor glimpses of of what of what can pass, and it's all stuff to do with the master. And the doctor's like, "No, I I killed his ass. He's good." <laughs> I, 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 mean, yeah, I didn't burned it did him. Yeah, I set him on fire, so he's done. And and it's like, no, you didn't pay attention when the editor cut away, and there was a ring on the ground. I know. I, there was a part of me that was like, they they really did just use the, the same. actual footage. Yes, they absolutely did. Didn't even bother trying anything else. That woman apparently took the took the ring and brought it to uh, what appears to be a cult gathering. Where these went, where these assortment of blonde women all worship the master. They didn't forget somehow. Yeah, they they remembered Roger Delgado's master. That's who they were expecting. They weren't expecting this fucking F tweaking the, out. This weasel. <laughs> yeah, this this uh this stoat of a man. <laughs> he really is stoat like, <laughs> like in a way where I I had even said it early on. I was like. If John Sims wasn't so damn charming, I would hate the master so much more. Yeah, it, yeah, it really only works because he's a very he's a very charismatic actor who's very good at chewing scenery. But Literally, it, they give him a chicken. They, and yeah, they give him goes, so much hey, to chew. Uh, I will say he's that so hungry. I do appreciate that they went back and decided to sort of explain why he's got why where these drums came from. Because when we saw Roger Delgado, there was no mention of drums. There was never any mention of the drums in the master's head throughout any of the classic series. That was a new thing that showed up as soon as John Sims master came up. And it's because of this story where they needed. Where, and they, they sort of justified it in the end that it wasn't just the master has suddenly gone insane. It's that the Time Lords put it in his head. Mm hmm. And because they've done it in this sort of like, oh, they weren't there all together, but because we're the Lords of Time, we can go back and slip it in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's since drawn the driven the master even crazier than he already was. Mm -hmm. They made him bleach his hair. Made him bleach his hair. That's, he's a bottle blonde. He came out of a bottle and now he's blonde. <laughs> we already kind of went over the the really, I thought, not great moment where to explain that his body is like acting weird. His wife apparently crafted the opposite of the potion yeah, of life. That's stupid. 
Yeah, and it's it's such a long, clunky exposition to explain why she has this thing and why it does what it does. Like, it's, it's so dumb. Like, I don't know why you put that in there at all. It seemed like they realized at the climax that the master had no way of getting rid of the t- of getting rid of the Time Lords with that, unless he has super electric powers. And so they had to reverse engineer the super electric powers. It I, I forget what I was watching exactly. It might have been a real, but it was the writers of South Park talking about like the difference between good and bad writing. Mm-hmm. And it's like good writing has like this thing happens which then causes this thing to happen, which then causes this other thing to happen. Yeah, the, but um, then the the inverse of that is this happens and then this happens and then this other thing happens. Yeah, the uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, I believe it was a college lecture they did where they said the on- the only two words that should follow any like story beat is therefore or but mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to because that means that your story is like being led from one thing to the other as opposed to you know, bad writing, which is the, which is what exactly what you said. And then this happens. And And then then this this happens. happens. Yeah. Which that moment alone was very like, you know, the master is being resurrected and then his wife busts out an antidote. And then he is not entirely corporeal. And then it was like, this is a very long walk. Like if you had justified, if you had just made the master, reborn but the people that were doing the science doing the magic behind it didn't exactly know 100 percent what they were doing because it doesn't fucking exist Mm -hmm. that alone is explanation enough for having him be like faulty yeah it yeah absolutely i like everything really to do with the master's body kind of falling apart doesn't really go anywhere except for him having the lightning powers at the end you know what I mean? Like, which just to him being reborn out of a prayer and a pile of ash. <laughs> I don't know. Because of, because of literally a ring and a smooch. Those are the those are the things that powered that spell. Were, like were if you ring. had just said it's because of the way that he was brought back. Now he has. So I like to use the example of Lisa Frankenstein. It's a movie we haven't watched. I, I've i seen it. You have not seen mm-hmm. it. In the movie, it is established very early on that there is a faulty tanning bed that like surges with power and causes the power around to go out. But that is the that is the thing that is then used as a tool in the rest of the movie to electrify parts of the body that are being sewn onto um, our our boy <laughs> without giving out any uh, too many spoilers but it's just silly enough and just campy enough that it's like okay i'll buy it i'll buy it. this world is silly i'll buy it that it's a faulty yeah. tanning bed that's causing yeah. reanimation to occur if this had engaged in any sort of logic like that, that it was not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a faulty tanning bed. It could literally have just been, we're going to have a light bulb explode onto these remnants of the master and that should bring him back somehow. Yeah. Like if there was anything like that, where it was some explanation having to do very loosely, very vaguely with science But it was the fact that it was literally just because even Matt, like, hi, witch here, even magic doesn't work like that. (laughs) (laughs) Magic, manifestation, no manifestation and spells are all it's all in here. It's all brain power and just, ooh, it's just doing things, doing things enough and making it a habit and, and manifesting and willing these things to happen in your life. <laughs> it's noticing patterns. It's being autistic, but it felt silly to introduce like fairy tale magic in a very sciencey show. Yeah. We're- because it wasn't even fairy tale magic that is like, Oh pff, yeah, it's backed by, this is backed by Dr. Who science. Yeah, where they, they didn't even. We just saw a man close a wormhole with a computer. Yeah, like there are ways that you could, like twist these into 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 like it. It's 
it looks like magic, but it really is science. But no, it really just feels like that episode with the witches where they kept being like, well, words are just their form of math. And I'm like, that that doesn't make any sense. It makes a hell of a lot more sense than a bottle. Yeah, it does. make It makes more sense than a bottle. But it's the exact same thing where it's just like this feels like you didn't want to come up with a reason. So you just said, eh, it's magic. I would have preferred them not show how the master came back yeah, at all. I kind of agree. They're just like that. He just does that because that's what he does. He's done it so much like the master has died, I think, three or four times and he just comes back anyway. Having a flimsy explanation as to how he came back this time. It was not not cool enough. It didn't need to be there. Yeah, just skip over it. Uh, I did find it very amusing when he's like with the two. I think they were meant to be like homeless. And they were I believe it was supposed to be like a like a Meals on Wheels thing where they show up to where the homeless show up to get food. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and as they're all sitting together, the master's like, oh, I'm the master of disguise. And here I am stuck looking like the old prime minister. I really enjoyed that callback because that was the thing. Roger Delgado liked putting on masks a lot <laughs> uh, only. But usually it's really obvious that it's him because he's Roger Delgado. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that it's very funny to me that he's like, oh, I'm the master of disguise. And now I look like I have the same face as always. It's like you always do that. You always look like you. You just put on sunglasses sometimes. Yeah, But in this time, he bleached his yeah, hair. Time, you bleached your hair. That's as much as you ever do. And he wore a hoodie the whole time. <laughs> uh, yeah, he did wear a hoodie the whole time. Which I typically... I I have such a complicated relationship with hoodies <laughs> because I didn't get it until I got it because I have one that is like that is the hoodie that is the only one I ever need and I got it for free from work. <laughs> I have a very similar story where I have one hoodie that I will only ever need and I got it for free because you gave it to me. Yeah, because it was your Christmas present mm -hmm. and I bought it for you and then didn't bother wrapping it. I just threw it at you. <laughs> So Merry, Ow, my face. Merry Christmas, you cold bitch. Put this on. <laughs> he made the hoodie work. I that that was that was where that was going. Yeah. I really just appreciated the fact that this version of the master literally just looks like an Internet hacker. <laughs> just looks, looks like, like a... he lives in his mom's basement. <laughs> you know, you're not wrong. That is very much what he looks like. I know I've already dissed Redditors, but he looks like a Redditor. <laughs> Uh, and so the doctor and the master have their little showdown in the quarry where they they uh, they, fight that they one just keep dubbing the wasteland, which I also think is really funny. I'm the king of the wasteland. Like, where are you? What part of London is this? <laughs> like, I feel like you guys are just that's just something where people work. Yeah, you guys are on an active construction site. <laughs> I am king of the wasteland. Hey, buddy, you got to move. Uh, we're bringing in some sand over here. <laughs> I'm the king of the wasteland. All right, King. Well, you're going to be buried in sand if you don't move. Uh, I mean, that's what it felt like. Got to put up some eye beams right where you're standing, Chief. So I need you to move. Not Chief, the master. All right, whatever you say, boss, you need to move. Not boss. Uh, so they're having their little showdown in the quarry. Oh, my God. I forgot all about that until I looked at my notes. Good job, me. When the master just starts a listing off, it's Christmas Day for the humans. That means beef and cakes <laughs> and juice and fat and cream and red wine and, and red wine. And then and the blood, only and blood red hot, 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 hot. As he's listing off, the only thing I heard was food glorious food. <laughs> We're anxious to try it. <laughs> Yeah, he, he really was. Why do they have to list so much food? And why is it edited so manically? Because <laughs> he's a madman. Just like I, <laughs> it feels like it sort of betrayed them. They, I feel like they cast John Sim because he sort of looks like an evil David Tennant. You know, they're, they're both very, they're both about the same height, both very like shockingly skinny He's men. like the round version of David Tennant. <laughs> yeah. David Tennant's all squares and the, and John Sim is all circles. Yeah. David Tennant pointy. Yeah. And so they. John and, Sim's. And then they wrote, the, they wrote these scenes and where he's supposed to be just like, like devouring whatever is put in front of him. Rabid. Because, yeah. But because he's such a scrawny little man, he doesn't eat that much. <laughs> 
he do just kind of look like like a hyena on the savannah. <laughs> so, yeah, they have their little fight in the quarry until suddenly a helicopter comes in and abducts the master. Yeah, a beam of light, and the master just kind of lets it to happen. <laughs> Which I think is because he wants to get away. He wants to get away from the doctor and just like be, do his own thing. He's like, "Well, this might as well happen right now." Meanwhile, the doctor just gets knocked out and left on the rocks. Oh, my favorite is that then when they take him to the mansion. The master is fully wearing a dog collar. Yeah, <laughs> he's being a red dog collar attached to a leash. Yeah, which I oh. I, I assume is that. Ha. <laughs> I was going to say, I assume it's that guy's. Yeah, finish, but, uh... we need handcuffs, sir. No, we don't. I have something. It's perfect for this. <laughs> uh, yes, they they the master is abducted by Joshua Naismith, uh, who is also quite a handsome man. Oof. I know him uh, as playing John Jones, the Martian Manhunter from Supergirl. Uh, you, I don't think you've probably seen him in anything, but that's how I know him outside of this show. And he, uh, he he apparently wants to make his daughter live forever using this alien machine that they found that they've decided to name the Immortality Gate. Yep, that's his gift to his daughter. Your gift to your daughter is to watch everyone she knows and loves die. I mean, the daughter seemed a little unhinged. I don't know that she has that many people that she knows and loves other than her father. Still, could you imagine if somebody was like, happy, merry birthday present, Zach? (laughs) I've granted you you immortality. Here you go. Also, me, the person who gave this gift to you is going to die in like, hmm. Maybe 30, 40 years. I will say they're doing some interesting. There's some interesting things that are going on with that dynamic, at least one that there is no mother. So you can presume that the mother has died. And part of this like immortality thing is in response to that. Can but I there, say something? Can I say something? Can I say something? Sure. Um, They didn't look like father and daughter. I fully thought that she was supposed to be wife until they specifically said daughter and I went, huh? Yeah, I think sort of the idea was that th- they're a little they're They seem a little off uh, in and that I way. I only knew she was daughter because she was wearing pink, the color yeah. of youth. And <laughs> I mean, it doesn't help that David Harewood has a very like very old man, s- young face. Yes. Yeah, he very, he's a very yeah, he's got a very young face is kind of what I was going for. But so I, old man. Yeah. Like he would pl- he would make a perfect elf. <laughs> but there is something to be said that you know the story ultimately is starts with the doctor also running away from his own mortality like when he shows up with the ood it's because he went on several adventures and the ood's going it's too late bitch yeah you really should have gotten here you, sooner we sent you this signal a while ago things are already in motion yeah so there's definitely something i mean there's something thematically with that idea of characters trying to escape death because you've got the master who did die and escapes death. You've got this daughter who is, who wants the immortality gate to escape death. The time Lords all trying to escape their own death and the doctor himself also trying to escape death. Like there's a, there's an interesting theme through line there. It's not very well executed, but it's there. (laughs) Yeah, you could write a paper about that. Uh, we actually uh, we were actually sent a video essay on Twitter. Uh, someone wanted me to watch to uh, it, it's like I didn't want to show it to you because it had spoilers in it, not just for this, but for future stuff, too. So I mm. can't show it to you. Um, but some- oh man, I don't I don't get to watch a video essay. <laughs> Your favorite thing. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm that kind of dork. Uh, you and- just you're just way more. uh uh, interested in other people's hyperfixations. <laughs> I'm more of a visual person. If you're, your video essay has anything to do with historical costumes, yes, I'm there. You're too interested in your own hyperfixations to be interested in anybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> One year later, I'm still thinking about Baldur's Gate. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite moments at when the master has been is talking with with Naismith with Joshua. Uh, he goes, "I like you." You taste great. <laughs> yeah, he's so fixated on how people on, on food and eating and. And then until the episode is over, then he promptly forgets that. <laughs> no, it happens again in the in the second part. When is that? I can't, um, uh... In the alley 
when Dawn is surrounded, they go, this was so hungry. <laughs> I am going to insist you never do that again. You didn't like you my... Can, I don't know how it sounded for the folks at home. I was too fixated on your teeth and the lip combo. You didn't like my Hannibal Lecter Stop impression? Stop it. No. Fava beans and a nice candy. Zach, I need you... Fun fact, I never seen that. It's a good movie. You should watch it sometime. I know I would like it. <laughs> and so uh, they, Naismith asks the master to fix the immortality gate for his daughter, and the master does just that. Uh, meanwhile, the two aliens that are there to uh, pick it up are two little green uh, cactus people, as Wilf calls them, known as the Vinvaci. As uh, the Vinvaci. <laughs> the Ita- Italian cacti. The doctor then bursts into the into the mansion, like trying to stop him just in time to find out that uh, uh, the master has already seen his plan through. He's already fixed, fixed the immortality gate and which fixes whole planets, according to the Vinvachi, which seems. Ill thought out as a as a device in general. Yeah, I thought they were going to say. Because somebody had made a comment of like, that's an awful lot of space for one person. And they went, oh, this can. And I went, that makes sense. It can heal several people at a time. Not nope. entire planets. Nope. Whole planets. Well, what would have been that funny. doesn't is, make sense. <laughs> what would have been kind of funny to me is if they had been like, yeah, whole planets. But then we find out that a Vinvachi planet or uh, it was the size of our moon. Yeah, it's like the size of the moon. So it, it only goes through like part of the world. All like Americans are untouched and China's untouched, but like all of Europe is messed up. Hmm. <laughs> and all the Americans are just like, what the hell's going on over there? It's like all of Europe, part of Northern Africa <laughs> and like the like Western side of Russia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would have been that would have been kind of funny. <laughs> Greenland, Maine, <laughs> only Maine, only Maine. <laughs> and I guess part and I guess Newfoundland. Uh, and so the the master reveals that his plan was to jump in the machine himself and cast his broadcast himself into every person. Yeah. And create the master race. <laughs> what a pun. What a clever. What pun. a good name. Original. Well thought out. <laughs> it was definitely that was definitely something that one of them just like thought up. And they it were, feels and they- like when I have a, a funny joke, that's only funny for like maybe half of an intro i.e. the Walters of Marlboro <laughs> that is not funny it's at least as funny as the master race yeah. and they put that shit on television it doesn't help that he's there this was the first time I was like wow it's a good thing he doesn't have blue eyes or else the master race would be blonde hair blue eyes <laughs> uh, yikes and so the and the way everyone becomes the master is we we said this in the middle but I still really like the way that they all change just by shaking their heads real fast like what dogs <laughs> I like to imagine that's the noise they were making as they shook back well, and forth it has to be <laughs> what other noise could you make Zach shaking your head around woo nah Stop. You're alerting the bean. <laughs> Sorry, bean. And her bushel of paws. Look at them. But then we start into episode two where as we, where Donna's head explodes to to save her to save herself. Yeah, as she's having like a full on like existential meltdown. Oh, it's not just that. Look at those things again. Those creatures. Look how I see a giant wasp. Uh, so we're caught up to where we were talking about before with the doctor strapped to a gurney and then having to be chased out of the building by the Vinvachi. I do really like that. It's is one of the first and maybe only times that the doctor has been physically vulnerable. Yeah. So <laughs> like, he is at the mercy of everybody else around him. He's even going like, not the stairs. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. I love a good physical comedy moment. <laughs> the the doc the doctor, the Vinvachi, and Wilf all escape onto on the Vinvachi ship, which is just like apparently supposed to just gather like junk from space, like spaceship junk, to take back home. Oh, because they're scavengers. Yeah, they're scavengers. But the ship gets all uh, wrecked up by the doctor doing his stuff. Yeah, the ship doesn't get wrecked up. The doctor wrecks the ship. And so they just kind of have to peter around on the ship for a little bit while the master is 
Peter ring around Peter around the, the world. Well, I do enjoy that when he becomes President Obama, part of the part of the story is that Obama is about to end the financial crisis that was happening. And he had some sort of financial saving algorithm, I guess. And the master's like, oop, I just erased it. <laughs> I'm like, you can do that. I wish I could do that. There are so many like intrusive thoughts I would just delete if I could. Oh, I do. But then it comes at the cost of me deleting actually important information. <laughs> like people's birthdays. I don't remember that shit unless I write that down. <laughs> That's the entire reason Facebook exists now. The nightmare I had as a kid where I was playing in the front yard and a person in a yellow bug drives up and just nabs me right out of my yard. I remember that clear as crystal. <laughs> that just scared me so bad. Uh, throughout the both episodes, there's this woman that keeps appearing to Wilf and basically telling him what to do to keep the plot going. And they never explain who she is. Yes and no. Because you do see her at the Time Lord Council as seemingly a human weeping angel. Yeah, they, she is one of the she's one of the only two Time Lords that voted against the action against the action to basically destroy Earth uh, at the expense of at the expense of their own lives. But she's also telling Wilf that he has to be at arms yeah, and, and to be prepared. I do find it kind of amusing that at the end of the near the end of the episode. Wilf goes, that woman, who was she? And the doctor just doesn't answer, which tells me they did not have an answer. No, uh, I will tell you, there are some fan theories. Uh, one of them is that that is Susan, the doctor's granddaughter. Uh, the main run, the main reason that doesn't hold it for me is that the doctor does not respond to her in that way. And the other theory people have is that that is the doctor's mother. I also got those vibes. I just that feels like wild yeah, and that's the thing is it doesn't really matter which one of them is true if either because it doesn't it doesn't change anything really uh they do have one really nice uh discussion on the ship which is between wilf and the doctor where wilf keeps trying to hand the doctor a gun not a gun his gun yeah he brought a gun with him uh because the because the woman told him to uh basically get strapped motherfucker you're gonna go on an adventure today i did like just going back to the soldier thing they did they in this moment, they established that Wilf was in uh, the pal was in the same uh, in the same event in Palestine that Bernard Cribbins was. They just they basically just translated that from the actor to the character, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of neat because then it means when as he's giving this like speech about him seeing combat, he get he can do it from from his re from his real place mm -hmm. as opposed to having to fake it being about World War Two or something. Yeah. Um, cause I think they had kind of, kind of alluded to that being the case that he was a world war two vet. And then this one, they were like, no, 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 we're going to retcon it so that it's, it's the same thing Bernard Cribbins did, mm -hmm. but they keep having this back and forth where Wilf keeps making these really strong cases of like why the doctor should take the gun, like do it to protect yourself, do it to save the humans, do it, be, do it be, like, cause you, he just like, don't put the master ahead of us. Like we're. We're better than him. He's a bad guy. You can't put him ahead of the entire human race. And every single time the doctor pushes it back and pushes it back until suddenly the Time Lords are like, hey, we need a physical thing to send to be our like beacon there. And so they're like, OK, we're going to throw this little diamond through the diamond. And then the master's like, hey, doctor, Time Lords are coming. I'm going to come. <laughs> I've got a shiny thing. <laughs> Look at me. I'm a possum and I got my shiny. Ooh. I'm going crow mode. I got my my shiny thing now. <laughs> you better run, Ducky. And it's going to bring the Time Lords and that and been saying it's going to be the Time Lords is finding what brings the doctor to be like to take the gun after a full like five minutes of saying no, never. I will never do that. That is as soon as it's like, hey, the Time Lords are coming. The doctor's like, give me, the gun. Give, give me that gun. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> and, you know, Wilf makes the point of like, aren't isn't it good that all your people are showing up? Like, you make them sound so great. And the doctor says, yeah, that's how I like to remember them. Which, you know, that's that's real. That's legit. Well, because like I think specifically about like. When somebody has died or like if you have a friendship that doesn't let like live forever. Mm hmm. There's the argument of like, well, wouldn't it be nice to just see them one more time? And it's like, no, no I, 
you kind of it's better to just remember them as they were. Keep all of the positive, good, squishy, fluffy memories mm-hmm. because that is what you carry with you the rest of your life. But then also to to negate that, it's like the doctor specifically says that the Time Lords are worse than any enemy that they have fought ever. Mm hmm. Especially in that moment, because what the Time Lords want to do is erase all of existence so they can ascend to, to godhood effectively. And the Time Lords come in to do exactly that. Apparently, all of the Time Lord High Council has agreed to this plan, except for two of them, including the woman we mentioned earlier. And the uh, Timothy Dalton, who is playing a uh, Rassilon, the president of the Time Lords, uh, says that they will hide their faces in shame like the weeping angels of old. And that sparked an interesting theory. I'm curious about your thoughts on mm. uh, are weeping angels, former Time Lords. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, we did see the the two the two like ladies that were covering their face like weeping angels. Mm-hmm. But also them looking up didn't seem to have any life or death repercussions. Yeah, there was sort of, I mean the theory is basically that there's But the, the, also weeping angels themselves can send you back in time. Mm-hmm. That's the yeah, the theory is basically that becoming a weeping angel is so, is a, sort of like the death penalty from a, from a time lord, like you can't regenerate anymore. You're you're stuck in this like peer, you're you're stuck in like fragments of time where you can only move and things aren't looking at you. Like it, it's a very interesting idea. I um, like it though. It's, yeah, it is kind of neat. It's scary. <laughs> and so Rassilon and the and the other members of the council show up just just they just appear. They just poof into the room. With uh, with the doc, with the master. And as we established, the doctor uh, decided to jump out of the ship to enter this room uh, and crash through a glass ceiling. Onto that the was only floor. after we did a round of smugglers run. Oh, I, you're right. I totally forgot to mention the writer doesn't seem to think very highly of NATO's missiles because they say that they sent basically all of NATO's missile capacity at the doctor and they're defeated by a green guy and an, and one old man. They did say that the ship is equipped with like motion sensing, like lasers. So they, all they have to do is fire them. But (laughs) also Wilf is in a literal spacecraft. We just saw him marveling at the wonders of outer space. Not moments ago. (laughs) Do you think he has the capacity to shoot a thing, a moving target in a, moving ship (laughs) that is not moving laterally it's everywhere all around the place but yeah so they they have their little shooting shooting round of smugglers run and the doctor jumps out of the ship and crashes through the ceiling of the building Mm -hmm. landing hard on the marble floor and i can't help and i i know i told you about some of the other ways the doctor has died what includes falling off an exercise bike i thought it was a horse no he was on he was on an exercise bike. Granted, it was the reason they had to do it was because uh, Colin Baker, when he left the role, he did not. He was basically fired early and was then asked to come back for the regeneration. And he went, no, fuck you guys. Uh, and so the all they had was the new actor wearing a wig. And so they shot him from the back and then the TARDIS shook a little hard and the exercise bike with him on it fell over and he bonked his head real hard. But for some reason, falling off an exercise bike triggers regeneration. They bonked his head real hard. Yeah. Falling stories from from the sky through a glass ceiling onto a marble floor does nothing. He's scrappy. Earlier in this episode, he was hit by lightning to the chest. He's scrappy. He must be because good Lord. And so the doctor is immediately like telling the doc, telling the master about how bad this is that they're coming. Uh, and he lists some other things that are going to come across with the mass, with the Time Lords, because the Time Lords won't, won't just be the only thing coming across from the Time War. He says it's not just the Daleks. It's also, and I quote, the Scarrow degradations, the horde of travesties. <laughs> Me and my friends when we go to the mall. <laughs> uh, the nightmare child. Me in my room alone. Uh, and the could have been king with his army of meanwhiles and neverwares. You, Bailey and Monty. 
Monty is the could have been king here. I'm the meanwhile. <laughs> Which is there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that they just dropped there with no context. Those, those are just bad things that were happening in the in the time war. The nowhere child. Yeah. Or the 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 nightmare child. Yeah, it's so it's I mean, that might actually be Monty. Yeah. The doctor's saying, like, hey, this is what's happening. This is a problem. And the master's like, well, it's fine because I'm going to turn all the time lords into me lords. You can't spell time lords without me into me lords. (laughs) And so pick number three, me lord. And I really enjoy that. Like, as he's explaining their plan, Rassilon's just like, bitch, what? I've got a time glove. And he yeah, is I've like, got a gauntlet. You, un- you understand I'm God, right? I'm I'm your God. And he closes his fist and all the humans turn back. And one of my favorite things about them turning back. So this story so far has taken place over at least 24 hours. Everyone changed. The, st- the diamond fell at night. And then at the end, at the next day, the master said, I've been working all night to acquire the diamond. So it's been a full day since then, but most of the people are still standing exactly where they were when they first changed. Obama, My- <laughs> Obama is still in front of his podium. Uh, Donna's fiance and mom are still standing in the kitchen. My thing would be that if it's if it's the master who is like controlling everybody there is a good chance that he only has the ability to communicate with like one to four other like figureheads i don't think they were i don't think they were like communicating in that way like that wasn't like telepathic control of them it was that they all became the same person yeah so if because even he did not move very far yeah he did not venture far outside of the mansion i just like to imagine that uh the master that was obama just keeps giving a presidential address from that podium for a full 24 hours i mean how i would you don't tell me what to do. I will continue doing what I had been doing for several minutes. <laughs> like all of them became NPCs and they just had to, yes. <laughs> they had to go through their cycles. Uh, yeah, because that that one lady was still on television after a day. It was just very funny that they I don't think they just thought that through at all. They just went, OK, we have this footage already. We'll just play it in reverse. Not thinking about how, oh, this should be like the next day. They should have at least like sat down for dinner. Some of them should have like laid down for bed. I just had a thought, Cassie. Uh, at one point, the Wilf asks the doctor if thing has changed even people in their graves. And the doctor's response is basically, yeah, it kind of did. Does that mean there are some master babies? Just like some little some little babies in cribs, little toddlers waddling around in their diapers that just had their like heads Colin, shake violently. Like Colin Robinson in that one season of what we do in the shadows. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. I fully think that. <laughs> and, the, and it was that they clearly all changed sizes. So does that just mean that he like just popped it like and ripped open all those kids clothes that just like laying on the floor or br- or like burst open a crib? Yes. Wah. Wah. Goo goo ga ga. Goo goo ga. Hungry. <laughs> it's very good. Oh, master baby. That is one sound away from a different. Hey, I'm just the master baby. No. But I know you know you that mean. there are some people that were caught in the middle of that, too. <laughs> are very shocked when they stood up and went, hmm. <laughs> I did feel bad, though, as the master is after everybody's turned back into themselves and he's angry with the Time Lords just saying, you made me. You did this to me. You did this to me. All of my life. Like, oh, yeah, like they ruined you. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, he did just threaten to convert all of them into him as well. Well, yeah. But also, yes, that what they did to him is incredibly fucked up. Nature versus nurture, dude. Yeah, they they went they just they went like, what if we tortured this child forever for, for hundreds of years? Because the master is also very old. He's at least as old as the doctor, basically. Mm-hmm. So. 
you're talking 900 years, they decided we're just going to throw this, this little taunting noise in the back of your brain. It'll, it'll torture you, but for it'll let the rest of us, it'll let, it'll let me feel better in a few years when we get stuck. You, it'll let us out. It'll let, let us out of this little room that we trapped ourselves in. That is so crappy. Yeah. But because of that, the master fights Rassilon as as Gallifrey disappears, presumably taking the master with them. It's the doctor standing in the middle between the two with a gun, having to choose between. Siding with the master or siding with the time. Yeah. Lords. Lord president or master. And then when he ultimately makes his decision, him just saying, get out of the way. Yeah, I kind of went, duck. <laughs> Where? Where's the duck? I'm hungry. I just love get out of the way. Yeah. Because that is the pen, like, that is the ultimate, like, he truly doesn't want anybody to, he does not want to actively kill anybody. Mm -hmm. He will have other things do that for him. <laughs> Yeah, it was very uh, it, there are very good beats in this story. It, it overall is kind of a mess, but there are still good beats in it. And that is one of them where the doctor is having to seemingly do this mental dance back and forth as he has to choose between these two impossible options because he doesn't really want either of them to win. But at the moment, it seems like one of them will have to. But yes, as Gallifrey disappears with the master and Rassilon fighting, it appears that the master faded away with Gallifrey. So who knows if we'll see him again? You know. Well, you don't know if we will or not. No, I don't. And the doctor is left on the floor realizing that he made it. He's still alive after all. All those knocks, people knocking four times, that didn't matter. He's, he made it. He's alive. He survived. And then you hear. Thunk, 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 thunk. On the glass. Thunk, 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 thunk. Wolf went in there to protect himself. And I think he does that knock of four, four times, too. So there's two different ways he's knocked four times. It, it's it, as soon as you hear it, there is a part of you where your heart breaks a little bit because you know what's about to happen. Yeah. Like, even if you even if you don't know that tenants about to regenerate, you kind of know in that moment. And I and I really like this, like monologue he has to himself where he's really upset because he knows that he is more important to the universe than Wilf on like a on like a broad scale level. On a cosmic scale, he is more important. Yeah, but to him the thing that makes him important is that he will save Wilf. And so he does. Well, cuz he's also had this like ongoing crisis about how anytime he regenerates, yes, he is the same, but he is not the yeah. same. And so each time he regenerates, like any of the things that he's learned, any of the progress he's made, the connections he's forged, all of that gets lost. Yeah. And he base, he does die with each generation. And it's a, it's really effective coming from tenant too, because we just saw him, like last at the end of the sea at the end of the season refuse to regenerate. So when he says so when he at the end of the episode, when he says, I don't want to go, you know, he doesn't No. And he's been he was he put it off as long as he physically could. Yeah. What, where did the regeneration start? His hand. <laughs> um. So, yeah, he has he has this moment where. Wilf is saying, no, 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 you you should live. You should keep going. You should move on. I've lived my life. I'm an old man. Yeah. And the doctor goes, Wilf, it would be my honor. And I don't know about you, but I was certainly crying. <laughs> my eyes were itchy and I was thinking about how itchy my eyeballs were. So, no, I was not crying. I, was I wasn't itching. crying. My eyeballs were itchy. No, Zach. My eyeball, my eyes hurt. Zach, I need you to understand. I don't cry. In I'm not crying during this show. Somebody just put tears on my pillow. My eyes were itchy. I need you to understand. It is allergy season <laughs> in our city. So the doctor steps into the chamber that Wolf is stuck in, gets Wolf out, and then absorbs five hundred thousand rads of radiation. I believe they say. I don't know how much that is. It's pretty radical um, Boo. <laughs> and so 
the doctor steps out and they basically they just I think it's just an excuse to like the doc, like what what the doctor hit would not kill him immediately. It, w- it gives him enough time to say goodbye to it's, everybody. They basically give the doctor cancer. Yeah. Um, and so the doctor, as we've said, goes on his like goodbyes tour to everybody that we've ever seen in any of the shows. Uh, any any character that he's interacted with positively from uh, well, at least ones that are still alive from Rose, uh, Mickey, Martha, uh, Donna's family, Captain Jack, Captain Jack, Sarah Jane, Alonzo from the Voyage of the Damned. He visited. Who is the author? Uh, so that was the granddaughter of the wo- the woman from uh, the family of blood two parter when the doctor was John Smith. OK. Yeah. They have the same actress playing her. Um, and that was why he, he asked, was she happy in the end? Because that was the woman that he would have been with had he stayed as John Smith. Um, I thought it was a nice touch to bring her in. That's, that was sort of a surprise mm-hmm. because I, I feel like that was pro- from Davy's perspective. I think that was one of the most important episodes they had. Yeah. Um, I, and I really think that was a nice, a nice one to bring together. At the end of the goodbye tour, he sees he sees Rose and Jackie and Jackie walks off to go get drunk and presumably sleep with somebody. And the doctor says hi to Rose. Uh, just, just it, it didn't really seem like he wanted to say hi. He just sort of convulsed involuntarily. And Rose thought he was having dr- had drank too much for a New Year's. Uh, and then Rose reveals that the year is 2005. The year she meets Christopher Eccleston. You're going to have a good year. You're going to like almost die a lot. Uh, but then at the end of it, you're going to turn into a god for a minute. That'll be kind of neat. Uh, and then, then you'll go to another planet with your dad. Yeah, you'll go, you'll go to another dimension with your dad. Uh, sealed away from all of your friends, uh, only some of your family. And then later on, later on, uh, I, I will give you a clone of myself. Oh, wait, sorry. The the. The parallel dimension stuff is next year. So you're going to have a really great year this year. Next year might suck a little bit, though. Uh, the doctor realizes he's regenerating and he makes his long walk back to the TARDIS where an Ood shows up to say, "We, the universe will sing you to your sleep. Hello, I'm the universe here alone on this snowy street. Here, let me let me hook up my waterproof shower speaker to my shirt lapel. <laughs> It has it has Bluetooth to the rest of the universe. So if you only hear one voice, just know that we're all perfectly in sync. Ah! <laughs> and he, he steps inside, sees his orange, his, his the tang coming out of his body again. And he, he, does he a, says, I don't want to die. He, he does one little short lap around the TARDIS console and goes, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Ah. And then explodes and then in an instant turns into matt smith yes matt smith the youngest actor to ever play the doctor how old is he uh would you like to guess how old he was in that scene 26 he was 26 you are absolutely correct whoa yeah uh, he is the youngest actor to ever take on the role of the doctor he was 26 at the time uh younger uh the breaking the record of david Tennant's father-in-law peter davison uh, so it's very interesting that he. Uh, oh, they just keep getting younger and younger. Yeah. Uh, well, he, he's still the youngest to this day. Uh, well, yeah, but everybody who has met the doctor in any form <laughs> keeps commenting on how young I think he it's is. only Sarah Jane that has been able to say, like, well, they just keep getting younger. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Moffat had wanted an older actor to play the doctor. But mm-hmm. uh, as you'll see, Matt Smith carries with him both he's very young but he carries with him a very old soul which you do not get at all from his opening scene where he is marveling at how many fingers he has it's like he's seeing fingers for the first time which i guess he kind of is again yeah he's seeing his new he's seeing his new hands two legs legs. a chin blimey i really enjoy that he that they made the actor acknowledge that he has a giant chin uh there was apparently a bit of controversy when he yells out still not ginger some people thought he was celebrating the fact that he is not ginger and people took offense to that because people had forgotten in the beginning of David Tennant's run. He had asked if he was ginger because he always wanted to be. Mm-hmm. So that was that was all of David Tennant's run uh, hmm. culminating with Matt Smith 
uh, crashing, as he says. I don't want to I know I know it's kind of late for us here, so I don't want to make you go on too long. But I'm curious, how are you feeling about uh, David Tennant's run overall? I didn't like the beginning. OK, it, it felt a little odd to me to have him take such a 180 turn from being this like war veteran, like traumatized man just trying to pull things together and make things OK. Mm hmm. To then being like an automatic, like almost sex symbol. Yeah. It, it's just, it's a very odd choice, particularly since like this is, this, this is coming from a place of like David Tennant is a very attractive man. He's not conventionally like kick your shoes off handsome. Yeah. I'm sure to somebody he is, but. Well, yeah, but it's also in performance how he holds himself. You know, if he can speak in his normal accent. Yeah, if you're even if he's Scottish, then it all all bets are off at that point. But when he's having to do a bad English accent. So there there is a part that's like I understand why so many people like him as the doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting <laughs> on my doctor. OK, I don't think he's it now. He was the one I was the most excited for. OK. Because I think that's the he was the only one that I really knew of. OK. Matt Smith is another one that I know a lot of people like. Mm -hmm. But because I will say that, Matt, that Matt was, Smith is my favorite doctor. That was not the part of the Internet that I was on during that time. Yeah. And especially, especially by the time that I got to college, a lot of the people that were Doctor Who fans that were I was surrounded with were older than me, so presumably their doctors would have been Tennant and Matt Smith. So I feel if, like I mean that that was the height the height of the show. I think was ten and eleven, um, and eleven is eleven is unquestionably my favorite. I'm not going into this expecting him to be yours. I mean, I'll be happy if he is, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying not to have any expectations for who will or won't be your ultimate like landing place for you. Like if you, when we find your doctor, I do like that. I do like that. The end of his series does show just how many characters that didn't just like they not, not just characters that you like got to know and really got to appreciate their their existence, but that got to continue stories after mm -hmm. um, like some of them would come back. Some of them I, I shouldn't say some of them. All of them came back at some point. A couple of them even got their own shows. They clearly have like these lives that they're living and when, I, they're not, I, when the show isn't featuring them. It's I do like that after a time, David Tennant does get to bring back some of that like traumatized war vet. Mm -hmm. You know, we we do get to see some more vulnerability and especially with Donna. Mm -hmm. Like we see a very different doctor than we did with. Martha or Rose. Yeah. And it feels very and it, it's still this like war vet. Guilt that he's carrying, but he portrays it differently than Eccleston in a way that I think is really interesting. Um, but I'm I'm very excited for us to keep going uh, on to Matt Smith because he is my favorite doctor. And this upcoming season is also my favorite season of the show. No spoilies. Uh, yeah, no spoilies. But we, will we know how I get when things are. It, these things are too hyped up. Yeah, I'm not going to hype them up too much because uh, it's not a perfect season, but the, some of my favorite stories are in it. Yeah, you've already the this show has already been a roller coaster ride of I have not been thoroughly impressed. OK, not in the way that I would expect to for a show that has such a long history attached to it. Yeah. I now, mean, I will say I think that I think I'm biased because I've become quite fond of the classic stuff that we've watched together. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder if that's, if that also has to do with it of if you were younger growing up watching, having your parents show you classic who, and then, you know, you get to now grow up and you have your own new stuff. Yeah. Like, I'm sure that that also plays a big part in it. Whereas I am coming in with fresh eyes. I mean, I, I came into the show on the new series, although I was like 19 at the time. So there could still be something of like, I was still very young. Yeah, but you were also a uh, very single and a dork. 
Moving past that. Uh, <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> no, I, no, that was very true. But let's talking about the classic doctors. Uh, so you've got four doctors under your belt so far. You've got three, four, nine and ten. Um, I mean, you got a little sampling of five, but I'm not going to count that yet. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, how would you of those four? Do you want to give a little a little cursory ranking? Like you don't have to go into detail for it. I'm just curious if you have opinions on top to bottom so far. No, not no? not particularly. OK, they're all just kind of in the same. Just kind of in the same vacuum. OK, like aesthetically four has been my favorite, but. I. Of course, of course he was. <laughs> You're going to get a big a quirky guy with a big hat and a doofy scarf. Yeah, of course, that's going to be your yeah, favorite. You have a, a big oaf of a man with <laughs> curly hair and big dumb hat and a <laughs> hand crocheted scarf. Like, of course, of course, I'm going to like that the most. Well, I guess if that's the case, then we'll just have to keep going and see if maybe Matt Smith stands out for you against these other four. We'll uh, see. We'll see together on future episodes of Who is My Doctor? Who is my doctor? Who is indeed? Hi, kitten. Fifty episodes, four doctors, so much more to go. And I am really enjoying this ride that we are all on together. I want to specifically thank friends of the pod, Tony Goldmark, host of Escape from Vault Disney, and Jesse McAnally of the Cheese Wheel podcast for being substantially larger podcasters than we are and using their precious podcast time to promote our silly little show in these early days. It has been so helpful to us, if even just in boosting our fragile, fragile egos. You can also help us out by subscribing to this podcast and giving us a like or five stars wherever you're listening right now. Even Podbean. We see you little Podbean freaks out there and we appreciate you. If you're a social media freak, you can find us on Twitter, Blue Sky Threads and Instagram at WimdyPod. That's W-I-M-D-P-O-D. Next week, we get to start the journey of the 11th Doctor, my doctor, Matt Smith. So we'll see you next Tuesday, because even after Regenerations, your Tuesdays are still Whose Days.